Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to continue on with this season where we are talking to people, managers. And I, you know, I'm always excited for my guests. And I think this season, it's because I know a lot of them. And we've had some other interaction before this interview. And this guest today is no exception. Rhonda Mullen is a Director of Learning and Development at EPIC. And we have kind of an interesting story because Rhonda actually sought me out. She saw my uh, my LinkedIn learning course, which is available. I will link it into the, the blog post for this episode. Shameless uh, plug there. But she saw my course and she wanted to provide that for the people at Epic. And so they got access to my course through LinkedIn Learning. And then we did a fun little Q&A for the people at Epic. And it was a really good time. And I have to say, if you haven't looked into Epic, I would actually recommend it because they are a company that really supports learning and development. And they have a lot of opportunities for their people. So that was some of why I wanted to bring Rhonda on today. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and be a guest here on the podcast. Well, hi, Julia. Thanks for having me. It's so good to reconnect with you again. We had such a great time the first time we did it. And it's it's great to be back with you. Yes, I'm so excited. And I'm, I'm just going to let you kick it off because I feel like you know your professional journey better than anyone. And I would love for you to give us some context about how you got to where you're are, where you're at now and some of the experiences that you've had. Right. So I'm in um, professional development for employees as well as leaders. And, you know, it started out my career journey, which I won't spend a lot of time on. But years ago, it started with me doing facilitation and instructional design, being strong in those roles. Eventually, like many people, I got promoted then into a management role. And that was several years ago. And so I've been doing that journey ever since. And now I'm at Epic, the director of their learning and leadership development, where I am responsible for the global learning footprint. So I sit on the talent management team in HR. So every, and we have 6,400 plus employees at Epic across the globe. And I think, give or take, 18 countries. So, um, yeah, so anything that touches that global footprint of professional development, so things like onboarding, um, also our leadership, uh, a management leadership development program that we do, we have an employee development series. So things that at career, talking about, like, that's why we had you, career conversations, career planning and development, things like that, as an example. Yes, I love that. And I'm so glad that we're going to have your perspective today because I think it's such a diverse perspective, not only from your experience as a direct manager, but having this global footprint that Epic has and seeing some of the the differences there. So I, I want to jump in because I know that you and I, we, we can really go and talk and I, I want to make yeah. sure we keep it, you know, to, to an okay time. But 
let's talk about your management style. And I, I would love to know, you know, what is your management style now and how have you seen it evolve over the years? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's been an evolution, a learning journey for me. And I think I will continue to learn as a, as a manager until I retire, right? There's not one perfect manager. And just like any role, when you start out, um, you have hopes and aspirations of what you want to be in that role, but you have a lot of learning to get there. So uh, I would say my style is uh, very just uh, being a learning and development professional. It's about developing others. It's about um, helping them reach their aspirational goals as well and being the best version that they can be at work. Um, knowing that they have their own learning journey to, that they're on. And so it's identifying where their gaps are, where their strengths are, and working with both of those, hopefully in a very positive and empowering way. Um, so that's my style. Um, I would say it's also being authentic. I love authenticity in others. And so that's what I want to bring to the table. I feel like in order to have a really productive working relationship, there has to be um, kind of the real deal where we can be ourselves and feel safe being ourselves. And that takes trust. So I do prioritize trust when I manage mm -hmm. people. Um, it's probably one of the first and most important things in my book that I will start with because, you know, being able to provide feedback to someone looks very different when I have trust versus when I don't have trust. So I know I want it to be received in the vein that it's met and that is for their good, that I'm there for them, not against them. And so let's first build that foundation of trust. I don't feel like that's anything you can shortcut. You have to really do the work. And, and sometimes that's being honest and saying, I don't think we're there yet, but I want to be there. So help me get there with you, you know? So I'd say that's one of the styles uh, in my management. Um, also, as far as the evolution, uh, I think, you know, uh, I've just grown more comfortable with being honest with people and feeling like I can I have to just give feedback more honestly. And in the moment, uh, I think I was a little scared to do that as a new manager years ago that I was afraid they wouldn't like me. I think that's a shortcoming that a lot of new managers have. It's like, oh, I want my, my direct reports to like me and but it's they can like you even when you give honest feedback. And that's something I learned over time is that they, if they have that trust and they feel safe with you, they appreciate that honest feedback. And so I think that's that's been part of my evolution as well. I love that. Like first touching on the trust, I think that's such a key component that some managers forget when they get into management because I think that they see it almost as like a parent-child relationship. I'm the authority, therefore you must respect me. And the trust hasn't been built for that. And so I so appreciate you saying that. But also, you know, taking the time to get to know your people, understand who they are, to build that trust, to then be able to provide some of that feedback right? The positive feedback and the negative feedback. I think that's so, that's so important. And I think sometimes as managers, like you, you hit it on the head. There's this, I, I'm, I want everybody to like me. You know, I don't want to be the manager that everybody hates and talks about and all of that. But at the same time, you still have a job to do as a manager. And I think even the employees that don't take that feedback well, as a manager, that's such an opening for a conversation of what's missing in our relationship that we need to build, right? Do you feel like that that's something that, you know, resonates with you that you would be able to have that conversation? Oh, yeah. And I've had direct reports that there is that safe component where they understand that I'm sharing feedback for their good and for their development. If I were to be brutally honest here, I've had direct reports that didn't, we we didn't have that level of trust. Ultimately, what it comes down to, though, is sharing your intent, sharing your why and saying, I want there to be trust. I recognize there's not the level of trust that we both would like, but I still have this feedback to share. And all I can do is do my best in sharing, like I said, my intent and my why. It, ultimately, it is up to them if they'll receive it 
as intended. Um, I can't control that. And that was uncomfortable at first for me to think, well, but I want to fix that. I want them to <laughs> trust me. I want to make them. So at, at the end of the day, though, they have a say in if they're going to receive the feedback and they have a say if they're going to trust you. And, you know, to their credit, you know, they're, it's fair sometimes for them to have a certain level of trust distrust. I, I can appreciate that. But um yeah, so you just you you do make the steps. You you show that you're wanting to to have that so you can have that open dialogue. But like I said, at the end of the day it's up to them if they receive it that way or not. And sometimes you're just not going to get along. I mean that's yeah. that's human nature. You know, sometimes it's just not a good fit and that's okay. You know, people really take a lot of things personally and it's like Sometimes we're just not going to get along. Our personalities aren't right. going to mesh. Our styles aren't going to mesh. And, you know, that's okay. You just have to learn how to work. Absolutely. You're right. <laughs> okay. Let's get into kind of the, the process of becoming an employee. And I've been, I've been taking all my guests through this. And I want to start with the hiring process because there's so much noise and information out there around, oh, Hiring managers are only doing this and they're writing this off. And, and it's it's just, it's so, there's so much noise. And so I want to cut through that to, to really get to the heart of as a hiring manager, what are you looking for? And so I would love to know kind of get, getting into the weeds of the resume and the interview process. What, what are kind of your top things you're looking for on the resume? And what are some things you're looking for once somebody gets into the interview mm -hmm. process? Well, and, you know, this goes without saying, it's going to be different for every hiring manager, every role, right? But for me, I can speak to my experience is I figure out the big rocks, the big categories that I absolutely need met, the, the skills, the competencies met. And for me, there are some technical components that I need met. So I identify what are those top technical components. I also look at the, um, some call it soft skills or power skills. Um, I look at that to see, because in my role, those are important to be effective in your role in a learning as a learning professional. So I identify the top priorities there. And then just culturally, are we going to have a, a strong, is there a good, strong culture fit here? Is this someone that I feel I can work with and have that productive relationship with that I can build trust with? Um, and so I look, I kind of, there's this Venn diagram and I just, you know, find the sweet spot there. Um, as far as their resume, it's, are they, are they putting in the effort? You know, I've had resumes where there's typos. Um, you know, and, you know, it looks like it's met for another role at another organization. And so I'm like, if they really want and they're interested in the role that I'm hiring for, just put in, put in that little effort that mm -hmm. it doesn't really take that much more to show me that you are, uh, applying for the team, the position on my team. And if I see that, and I see that my little Venn diagram that I just outlined is being met, then I'm going to want to meet with them and, and go from there. Okay. I, I have to, I have to say something about the resume because I, I feel like what I'm seeing, at least on the career coaching side and some of the advice that other career coaches, not me, are giving out is, you know, just apply to everything, apply to everything. And it doesn't matter. Right. And and I feel like your example is the reason why you shouldn't do that because right. on the hiring manager side, and I would say a lot of recruiters would probably say this too. They can tell, mm -hmm. like you can tell that they haven't really looked at the job description. They haven't really brought out the skills and the things that you have very clearly outlined there, you know? And so I think anybody that's in, I, I think it's called the, the, spray and pray or something method or wh whatever that is. Right. Don't do that. Don't do that. I, I get that it, it's a tough job market right now, but it's not worth your time to do that, to have a hiring manager look at it and go, this is for something else. This is for like a completely different function or a different type right. of industry. And now you're out. That's why you're out. 
So I I have to say that because I I just hear so much bad advice. And I feel like what you just said supports those of us that don't give that advice. Right. Well, and it really, what I would say to the person that's applying and doing the work, here's how I would maybe shift my thinking on that is don't, you deserve more. So don't cheapen yourself by going, I'm just going to put in the smallest amount of effort, but throw it out to, you know, 50 people. Rather than to say, I'm going to show that I'm worth it to maybe a smaller number of people because by cheapening your, 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 your effort, it's like, that's what you're setting yourself up then for a potential match. So you want to make sure it's a match that you're interested in, that you are a good fit, that you're willing to do the work for. And if you're not willing to do the work, then the question becomes, is it really the right fit for you? So that would be. That would be my, you know, kind of that paradigm shift to, to consider. Yes, I love that. Thank you so much for saying that because I think people are really, I, I hope people hear that. Right. I hope they hear it and really take it into account because I think it's really mm-hmm. important. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about the interview process. What, do you, what are you looking for there? Um, well, I get to validate the things that I'm, those categories I mentioned earlier, the technical components that I absolutely need, um, but also the soft skills and culture fit. I want to validate that through, you know, having a conversation and digging a little deeper than what I'm seeing on the resume, Mm -hmm. you know, and is there chemistry, you know, that's part of that culture fit. Is there, is that someone that I want to be able to work with every day? Do they want to work with me every day? Mm -hmm. Do we have a good synergy? Because If you don't, then there may not be a productive relationship. And so, um, you know, a good interview doesn't guarantee anything, but I am looking for, can I validate what I'm seeing on paper? And then what type of connection are we having through that process? Yeah, I love that. Now, I I actually have a secondary question to this that I feel like you're probably the right person to ask. So as a hiring manager, especially when you're hiring for a team, You're also taking that into account as well when we're talking about culture fit. So it's a fit with you as the manager, but is it also a fit maybe with other people in your department and on your team that this person might be interacting with on a regular basis? Oh, absolutely. Because the applicant doesn't know the culture of the organization yet. They're hoping to find that out, you know, in, in their interview experience, but the hiring manager does have that experience and that insight. And so I feel um, through their conversations, hopefully that's explored. Like I said, I can only speak to myself as a manager. Like I actually have, and I want to make sure everyone knows um, when you introduced Epic, Epic, there's a couple Epics out there. We're EPIQ. Um, oh, and good. so there's an Epic out there, EPIC, but um, Epic, uh, I have a small team here at Epic. Now, I have been in a previous organization where I'm much larger, I have multiple teams. And so, uh, but yeah, it's something that I'm having, you know, one foot still in Epic trying to think about where, what that role needs as far as a good culture fit and, and the technical component. And then one foot in thinking about this person's world and do these, do these two come together uh, nicely? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your perspective on that. And we will make sure that Epic is spelled appropriately and linked appropriately. (laughs) I didn't know if it would be posted somewhere, but I thought, because I loved that you shared Epic is a great place to work. And and there are, we are a large organization and there's lots of opportunities. And so I did want to make sure I was like, well, we might as well sure that they all know how to spell it so they can find us. No, that's good. That's good. I appreciate that. All right. Let's, let's move through the process now. Let's say you've interviewed candidates. Let's say you've got two, I mean, almost identical people that you have interviewed. What, what do you do? How do you make those decisions when they are so closely aligned? That's a challenging position to be in because at some point you just have to make a leap, right? And you have to go with one of them. So I'm going to look, I'm going to look at all the components. And so I'm not just looking at, oh, all, you know, they have equally matched technical skills or they, I'm going to take in their, all of the, the big picture. So all the different categories, their, 
and and kind of weigh those out and try to be as objective as possible. I'm going to solicit feedback from other people when I do an interview. I have them, so I will ask for their perspective and I take it all in, all in. And usually there's something that will start to bubble to the top, even if they're close. Like when you take in all the information and not keep such a narrow focus. Um, and so, so that's going to be their years of experience, what they're looking for next in their career. Um, compensation might play a part in that. It might not, but so all of those factors. And like I said, usually when you take in enough information, it's almost like doing a survey. If you do a survey with three people versus 2000 people, you're, you know, the more information that you take in, the more I feel like the re more reliable the data is. So I just look at all of it. Yeah, I think that's so important for people to understand because I know I have clients and I just know of people that are making it to that last round and they're like, nothing was wrong. Like, I don't understand. It was a good interview. Everything seemed to work out and I still didn't get it. And I know that that's a lot of disappointment for people, right? Because they've gone through this process and gotten to know everybody. But I think this perspective is really important. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. that's why interviews get tacked on that weren't originally part of the process, right? So if that happens, it's likely that they're trying to decide between two or three people. But also, no, it's not necessarily that you've done anything wrong. Right. You oh, know? absolutely. Absolutely. And I know it can get discouraging. Um, I have a good friend who's going through it right now. And it, and she's talented, intelligent, and capable. And so it is challenging and it can become discouraging. But um, I, you know, I know this may not be a lot of comfort, but what I would say to those individuals is one, if you don't ask for feedback, start doing that. Um, reach out to either the hiring manager, if you have an ability, a way to do that, or to the talent acquisition team and ask for feedback. And so let them know, you know, I was really hoping that this was going to work and um, I understand it didn't, but can you help me learn from this experience? Can you help me grow from this? So I'm more, you know, even more ready the next time this goes through um, and leave it the door open because you just never know, mm -hmm. right? Leave the door open. It gives you that opportunity to circle back, show that you appreciate feedback, that you're open to feedback and that you want to leave the door open for uh, future opportunities. Yeah, I love that because I think sometimes people get really upset about it and then they just don't want anything to do with the company right. anymore. No. But I think mm -hmm. having that follow-up communication to say, thank you so much. If yeah. something comes up that you think I might be good for, please let me know and I will continue to look at the the website for new opportunities. I think that's such a good way to leave it. Even if you're upset, you can be upset. Absolutely. Right. But right. make sure that you still have that professionalism when <laughs> you're working with the hiring manager or the recruiter in that communication. Oh, absolutely. Talk about differentiating yourself right there. That is one way because it shows that you are mature enough to, you know, take rejection and that you're mature enough and open enough to ask for feedback. It really shows mm -hmm. you. I think it really makes you stand out uh, by taking those steps. So, Especially at a, at a larger organization. I think that's so important because there are so many more opportunities. And so even if mm -hmm. you're not the hiring manager, you might know the person or be able to just say, hey, pull this person's resume because I already interviewed them and they're really great. That's right. huge. That's what you That's need, right. you know, so That's you don't right. want to burn that bridge at all. Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day -day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. 
not all coaching requires a six month commitment. Career action coaching is three hour long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary career coaching clarity call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, let's talk about one-on-ones. I feel like this is something that I think is a struggle for so many employees because there really isn't a common way that it's done. You know, there's lots of advice out there and all of that. But I would love to know for you, what what do one-on-ones look like for you specifically? How do you conduct them? Like what's kind of the expectation through one-on-ones? Right, yeah. Because one-on-ones um, are one of the most powerful tools, resources, um, calls that an employee and manager can have. And so if there's anything to take away from this, it's like, make sure your one-on-ones are working for you. And so um, I'll first tell you just kind of how I do them, but give some, maybe some tips for everyone listening in on how to get the most out of their one-on-ones. So um, I set them up as reoccurring. This isn't, so it's the same time uh, same day of the week and they're set up and make them a priority. And I try to have them balanced so that there's time to check in on project work, of course, but also how they're doing as a person, like how's, you know, how are you feeling? What are you proud of at work? Making sure that you're touching the engagement component as well as the productivity component. And so, um, I, I have, this is just my, I have in OneNote kind of a template that we have set up for a reoccurring where we kind of jot down the things that we want to talk about coming up. So that way we both show up kind of knowing here's what some are some of the talking points that we want to make sure we prioritize in the one-on-one. Um, and then just, we have a recap. So if there's action items, so on that same one, and it's a shared OneNote. This is just my practice. I don't necessarily prescribe that other managers have to follow this. Not at all. That's just what I like to do. Um, But as far as one-on-ones, what I see a lot when I've had bigger teams are employees show up very um, passive to their one-on-one, not taking ownership. They just show up. Hey, what do you want to talk about? You know, what's going on? And small talk and all of that. It's great. It shows, creates connection. But um, I encourage employees, this is your one-on-one. And so show up with ideas of things that are important to you, things that you need help with. So if, do you have certain roadblocks that you need removed? Ask for help. If you feel lost in your role, admit to that. That's part of that trust. That I, I don't feel I'm doing well in my role. Because you know why? You want to do well in your role. And so the way to start doing well is saying, I don't feel I'm doing well. And I want help so I can be successful. So I would just think, what do you need in order to be successful in your role or to take the next? What is it that you want? Figure that out, get clear and ask for it. Um, I think, too, um, um, if you because, you know, I've had people say, well, I don't I don't know what to talk about. So I think starting there, you know, is key. Just um, but, yeah, it is a time to build a relationship, you know, and to talk about things outside of just projects and deadlines. But um, so I I think just taking more ownership. And if you have a manager that's not investing in you, ask them questions. Mm -hmm. I ask questions. What, what would you like to get out of our, like you kind of flip the tables. What would you like to get out of our one-on-ones? Here's what I would like to get out of our one-on-ones. What does that look like? How often does that mean? Is it every week for 30 minutes, every week for an hour? What can that manager commit to? Because I see managers that have 15 minutes a week. I see managers who have an hour a week. Some that it's every other week. So find out, get that cadence and get the commitment and um, start there. That's what I would encourage you to do. Okay. I think this is so important because not everybody can have a Rhonda, right? Like not everybody's going to have the manager that keeps the notes and is proactive in their relationship with their employees. Because every manager is different. Some managers just, they haven't had that training or that's just not their style, right? They're not, they're just not going to do that. And so I think what you're saying here is so important for people to hear 
sometimes you're going to have the manager that is involved and is right. going to lead conversations and is going to really help you be successful and go through it. But some of you are going to have managers that aren't like that. And it's not right. through any fault of their own. It just might be their style, again, lack of training and all of that. And that's when you as an employee really need to step up. And yeah. I think sometimes as employees, I want to say we get kind of like a chip on our shoulder, like, well, they're my manager. So mm -hmm. they're the ones that need to take responsibility. And I'm not going to do that because this is their job and all of that. And it's like, I hear you. I get it. But all you're doing is hindering yourself right. in that process. Right. The man, you're not sticking it to the manager. They don't, right. they're not going to care if that's already their, their way. Like it doesn't matter. Right. So right. you have to think about that for yourself. Like what is going to happen for you? You know, get what you can out of that person if you want to, you know? Right. Because I've, I've worked with managers that have so many direct, direct reports that they don't have time. And so then you kind of just, it's about adjusting your dial to go, okay, the ideal would be that I met with my manager every week, right? Let's start there. Well, you can't have that maybe with every manager. So then it's like, well, then what's next to ideal? Is it every other week? And it's through a conversation. It's just meeting with them and say, you know, I am, there's research out there. Studies show that having one-on-ones really help the employee to be more productive, to be more effective, mm -hmm. sets them up for greater success and engagement. And that's what I want for myself. I assume you as my manager want that. Right. So let's figure out what what does that look like for us like what can we both commit to for a one-on-one -on -one? and so it's managing up so if you have a manager like that i would say use this as a learning opportunity for yourself to go how do i manage up like maybe you don't know a lot about that today start there's stuff out there everywhere how do i manage up and there's linkedin learning courses julia that might be a <laughs> Why do we want to look at? But how do you manage up? There's books and articles. And, but I would say one of the first things would be just asking them questions about what they, where they can meet you and then get that set up. And if it's you setting up the one on ones, I've written those reoccurring meetings, there's no shame in that. I think that would be a wonderful thing. And it shows initiative, it shows leadership, it shows, you know, it shows you take it serious. And I think when you show that you take it seriously, they're going to go, mm, this employee, this direct report, they take it themselves seriously. They take their work seriously. So I think I need to start taking it more seriously. Yeah. You know, it just yeah. kind of naturally happens. But if you let it go and are just like, well, whatever, they're not scheduling it. I guess I don't have a one-on-one. -on -one, then that's how it's going to continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to get your opinion on this because because of the work that you do and you do work with a lot of managers and help resource them and train them and all of that. So if you are a manager that has a lot of direct reports is a good strategy because I was just thinking about this as you were talking because I'm all about how how do we help people do their jobs better, right? And so I'm thinking about the manager that's like, I just have so many direct reports and I can't do this, and I can't do that. But some of that, could you not prioritize some of your direct reports that maybe need a little bit more support? Like, I feel like as a manager, you have to have at least enough understanding of your team to go, okay, I've got this group over here that they basically run themselves and they don't really need to meet as frequently. And I know that and we're on the same page. <laughs> But then I've got this group over here. Maybe it's new hires or maybe there's a big project or something going on. And I know that I need to be meeting with them regularly and kind of switching up the cadence depending on the person. Is that something that you've seen managers do or maybe you would advise managers to do if they do have a lot of people reporting to them? Oh, yes. And I, I think that's an important skill in and of itself was adjusting your dial. For example, like, so yes, you're, you, but back to your example of having a new employee, they're going to need more frequent check-ins than your seasoned high performer employee. And so I think being able to adjust your dial is um, important. And I think newer managers sometimes struggle in this area. So I think just uh, being able to look at individual needs. And so 
it takes time to just sit down though and evaluate that. And, um, and there's also peer coaching. So if you don't have time, mm-hmm. I think as a manager, one of the things is I would first look at is, are there things you can delegate to your team to free up the time that it takes to have those one-on-ones? Mm-hmm. Because I do think one-on-ones are so important and delegation is important. And so I think I would look there, but then maybe set up some peer coaching and where they are meeting together, you know, uh, there's like high potential, high performing employees that can work with some of the newer employees as part of their development track. So I think that's a missed opportunity that a lot of managers don't maybe consider. They have to take, they think they have to take it all on themselves. So it's a blend. And so it's really is about going, well, what works for this individual at this time? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that idea. And I think for employees who want to get on that management track, right. but maybe haven't had a lot of opportunity, that's an amazing opportunity for them that is fairly low risk. And it right. allows you as a manager to evaluate how how mm-hmm. they're doing and help coach them on that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's going to be a great tactic for all the managers out there. (laughs) Well, and for those individual contributors, if your manager hasn't asked you to be a peer coach, bring it up in those one-on-ones to say you would like the opportunity to grow and stretch in your role and that you would like to be a peer coach. And so it's just about saying, I I can help some newer team members or uh, team members that are struggling. I can help work with them and develop them. And that is really developing you at the same time. Yes, I love that. All right, let's talk about something that not everybody wants to talk about, but we're talking about it here. And that is HIPS, Performance Improvement Plan. Sometimes they have other names at other organizations. But I would love to know kind of your perspective on PIPs and specifically what what's an employee doing to get to that point? Like how bad does it have to be to get to that point? And then can they recover from it? Right. So this is a challenging one to answer because I think, you know, when to say, what did they do to get to that point? I think that's so individual. Like that could depend so much on the manager too. Like is the manager, what's their tolerance threshold, you know, um, of working with employees that are challenged or struggling, right? Mm-hmm. There are some who have a, a very, you know, will do everything to to try to develop them and, and others that don't. So I would say, can they recover? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen it over and over and over again. So it's hard. I don't want to take away from the fact that if somebody is listening in and they are thinking that they might be going on a PIP or are on a PIP, it is, it is, it can be really challenging and hard. So I want to acknowledge that. But if you see it as an opportunity rather than an end, then work to find out, you know, can I uh, take steps? What are those steps? What is the time frame? Make sure you understand the requirements of the PIP and lean into it is what I would say. If that's a position you want to keep, first and foremost is making that decision. If not, be honest about it and say, you know what? It looks like maybe we're at a crossroads and a decision has to be made. And maybe you don't want to lean into that PIP and, and work things out for whatever reasons. But if you do, yeah, lean into it. And uh, because the ones that have leaned into it and it t- turned things around, I think oftentimes are really valued more and appreciated and respected more to say, my goodness, this is someone who took that pit and turned it into an opportunity for themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. But again, that all comes back to if you really want to continue in that role in that company. Right. Yeah. And I think this is such an interesting thing because a lot of times, not every time, most times you've been receiving feedback on something Mm -hmm. ahead of a PIP, right? Or you should have, again, not always, it depends on the scenario, but if you've been receiving feedback on something and you know that it's an area that you've been struggling with and trying to improve, I would encourage you as an employee to also keep notes for yourself on what you're doing to to develop that. Because I think the other side of this too is we all learn at different rates. We all pick things up at 
you know, at different speeds and all of that. And I think sometimes when we talk about that manager employee relationship, a manager might have an expectation because of who they are or maybe other people on the team that you just might not align with that. And so being able to advocate for yourself and say, hey, I'm working on this, but it is taking me a little bit longer or here's what here's the progress that I've made. Being very transparent about that. I think as as a manager, that's something that I would want to see is that you're working toward it actively. Right. 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 And those conversations are going to happen through those we are talking about, not to like hit that too hard. But if you're having those check-ins and those connection calls, then those are when you can ask, hey, this is, you know, I'm struggling in this area and I want to be, I want to do a good job. And so I'm asking for your feedback, your guidance, your coaching, all of those things can take place. So that's why it's so important that you have a time carved out where you can do that and not just limit it to, I would say your manager. So if you're working Mm -hmm. with teammates, uh, people who uh, maybe even report to the same manager and ask what they're doing, what's working for them, ask them for um, ideas, suggestions, feedback, the other managers, even anything that will help you succeed and be more effective than the better. Right. Right. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. I think this goes hand in hand with what we've been talking about, but let's talk about growth in a position uh, with your employees. So how do you keep your employees growing and and learning more for themselves? And what is your role versus their role in that? And you're talking about me as a manager this time. Um, I'm I'm going to talk about you as a manager, but then we're we're probably going to switch and talk about the, on the global, the yeah, global yeah. side, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I think through first of all conversations, like where are there, um, what it, it's it's um, not a simple one answer thing, right? So, for example, it says, you know, are how do you keep positions uh, employees growing? Well, where are they at as far as performing in that role, right? Mm-hmm. Are they do they have gaps that need to be developed? So I would look for opportunities to develop them in those areas. And that's by observing their performance, but also through talking to them about their performance and getting feedback from others that might have insight into how they're performing. And so looking for how do we develop this employee to be able to perform at their highest performance in that role? Mm. So that's one area. It's like, how do we get you there? And when they know that you are doing things to strengthen them so they can be that high performing, high potential individual. And that I'm wanting you to work on this stretch assignment to help you get there. They get excited when they know it for them. Um, So that I think is critical, Um, but also asking, well, what, what are you interested in? Like what's potentially next on your horizon Mm -hmm. and look for opportunities to develop them, to prepare them for that type of growth. So it's about the current role they're in today, but also thinking big picture, especially if you're in an organization where there's lots of opportunities, like what's the next chapter in the career and what, what steps can we take to start preparing you for that? Whether it's on your own team, a different team in your organization I know at Epic, we do that. It's like, we think about, all right, let's develop you for the role you're in, but also what's next. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I love organizations that do that, that really support people in saying, oh, I'd love to do this. Because I think so many employees are afraid to talk about what they really want to do and where they want to go in their career because they don't want to get fired. They don't want to be dismissed, you know? And I, so I appreciate that not only your style as a manager is like that, but even the style at Epic is to really help people move and get into the right positions and have that growth. Because again, having that internal employee saves so much time and money. And it blows my mind that organizations do not understand that it would be better to try to find somebody internally to move than to fire people and then rehire. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. Right. Well, I would much rather have an employee, a direct report move to another team within the organization because 
they're happier, right? And it also creates a reputation for managers that you're the type that does support employee growth and development. And then you're going to want employees, they're going to be employees that want to be on your team because they know that about you. So I'm like, you might as well embrace it and make the most and the best out of it. Yes, yes. Okay. Now let's put on your your director of learning and development hat and talk about kind of organizationally, what does growth look like? What what do you feel like Epic is doing well in terms of helping their employees grow and any advice that you have for managers around that? Well, keep in mind, I'm in the space of the global professional development. So um, not on the operation side so much where it's really uh, in the in the weeds with role specific, you know, there's teams and other learning professionals out there supporting that. And so, you know, some of the focus areas for me on a global scale is things that are really going to drive employee engagement, culture, um, employees, really one of the things we're doing well is um, we, we do, you mentioned LinkedIn learning, which is a passive learning, but it's available 24-7, 365 days a year, and our employees are using it quite a bit. But it's taking that as a jumping off point. So you don't just say, well, there's LinkedIn learning. It's out there for everybody to use. And, you know, they're going to use it as they need. Yes. But if that's all you do, it's a missed opportunity. So what we did is we took it and said, all right, let's, what can we build? Let's take focus areas that where we're wanting to influence culture, engagement, maybe take one of those courses. And it's not always LinkedIn learning. We've done other things too, but, um, and use it as a jumping off point. So that's where you like, when we interviewed you for your uh, course, you know, we said, Hey, let's take this and do a deeper dive. And so sometimes there's interviews, sometimes there's, uh, uh, learning activities that we build, team builders that we build around some of these on demand. And we have a really regular cadence for these, like at least once a month, we'll have something or once a month on average, where we have something for the employees to learn and grow, use as a learning opportunity for them. And we do do a pulse check with them to find out what areas are they focused on? What are their priorities? We also get that from leaders, managers, and and then build kind of the calendar of events, learning learning events for employees and managers alike around yeah. that. I, I just love this. And I know there are companies out there that do it. And so I, I hope that the audience is listening and going, what? This <laughs> happened? Because I think there are less companies that do it than there are more companies. But I love hearing about this and how you're integrating it and all of that. Because I think especially with a global company, that's a lot of people to try to get together to align and all of that. But how wonderful to have different touch points to say, hey, we're all going through this. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all going to go through this. We, You have an opportunity. I think that that also helps create a sense of belonging within the organization, even though it is a larger organization. So you have kind of your team and your management and your sense of belonging there. But then you have the larger organization. And especially if you're a remote company or your position happens to be remote, those types of opportunities give give such an an opportunity to see other people and remember, oh yeah, I'm I am part of this much larger organization. Yeah. So I think that's such a great opportunity for employees. Yeah. And then we have some programs that are uh, not quite so like where everyone is invited, but we might have specific um, live sessions that are just for that are all virtual that are because we are across the globe. And so uh, that are very targeted topics where there's more custom content built around. But those are very uh, we're more strategic with those um, because if you're going to do custom development, it should be aligning to some organizational need or goal. Right. And we do those as well. Um but yeah, so I would say, you know, we kind of, we uh, we have a nice balance of some of those targeted initiatives versus the ones that are really just that broad umbrella for all employees to participate in on a regular basis. Right, right. All right. So one of the things that I like to do on the podcast is make sure that I leave, uh, leave listeners with something really tangible for them to take away. So piece of advice or an action item or something like that. I'm actually going to ask for two perspectives from you. 
So I would love to know what is a piece of advice that you would give employees who report to managers to be successful in their position? Like, what do you think that they could be doing better or something that that you just want to impart onto them? And then similarly, what is some advice that you have or that you want to, to give to managers or people who want to become managers to do their job better and kind of show up a little bit better for their people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to kind of walk the walk and talk the talk, I would say <laughs> going back to that trust, I'm making sure that as an employee, it to know your your manager is human, and so they don't have all the answers for your career. They're not perfect, but to start with trust, to to and that may mean sometimes saying, "This is an area I want to work on with you." So I would say to the direct report. Um, giving your manager and knowing it's a partnership. It's not your manager handing things down to you and that you're just, you know, passively sitting there. So um, that it is a partnership. And so do your part in the partnership, meaning um, work on trust, take ownership of your role. Don't, you know, ask for feedback, Um, ask for opportunities to grow in your role, like show that initiative and that interest um, and that's going to set you apart and help you in so many ways. So that's one thing I would say for the direct report and for the manager to not underestimate the power of trust, <laughs> to make sure that you're also being intentional and building that and then prioritizing one-on-ones. And if that, figuring out what that means to you. And if that is an hour a week, if it's 10 minutes a week, I would take 10 minutes over nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, and I wouldn't even take a creative, um, you know, check-ins with doing it on teams, whatever it takes, just making sure that there's check-ins with your uh, direct reports and that there's that relationship building that will open up for opportunities for you to provide the coaching feedback. Um, Otherwise, if that's not already laid, then it's going to be really challenging for you to do when the time comes that it needs to be done. Yes. Rhonda, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I love hearing your perspective, both as a manager and then just in the role that you have at Epic for learning and development. Thank you so much for being a guest. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It was so fun spending this time with you again. So anytime I'm there. So thank you so much. I love it. Sounds good. (laughs) 